Then we have a tradition where, which is linked with mirrors, projecting mirrors, and that is obviously kind of uh, quite clear. So they said this is a long history uh, using parabolic mirrors, and it's also linked with military technologies because parabolic mirrors, uh, already in the in the in the classical antiquity, were seen as a possible weapon, basically, kind of attracting and redirecting the the rays of the sun and for example burning the burning the the sails of enemy ships entering the harbor things things like that so it is one of the first of the so-called uh, death rays that that then later in the 20th century became a became a discuss, topic of discussion and um, jesuits like athanasius kircher in the in the 17th century uh, described many uh, interesting uh, devices linking the idea about mirrors and projection. This is one of the most uh, ingenious, I think, this, uh, as you may know, but this uh, is called the machine to turn humans into animals. And it may need a little bit of explanation how that functions. He was actually, he was a Jesuit father who was, uh, had his own, own curious cabinet at the, at the Collegio Romano in, in Rome, in Italy. And like to devise these devices to, to kind of kind of amaze the, 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 the guests of the Jesuits and other Jesuits as well. So now in this case, this device uses natural light. So the so the sunlight that is uh, entering through the uh, window on the on the left, the window A. You see that in inside the room there is a mirror and a large mirror. And this mirror can, the angle of the mirror can be adjusted. There's a, there's a sort of like a pulley system behind it. In front of the person standing in the mirror, there is an, uh, like a box-like object, which is opaque object. So you cannot see anything what's inside the object. What it actually contains is, is this kind of a, like a, like a, the, the kind of a, like a cylindrical object you can uh, rotate with the hand crank. On each one of those faces of that object, there's a, there's a, uh, they have painted uh, animals' heads. And now the idea is that basically by carefully adjusting the mirror and changing the position of the mirror so that the person doesn't actually notice that happening, uh, when he sees his reflection in the mirror, the changing of the angle of the mirror will actually make your head to be replaced by an animal's head, uh, and uh, which which is seen as a certain kind of natural magic trick. Natural magic because it's human-made magic using natural laws like the laws of optics or the reflection of light that that kind of things. It's not like black magic, things like that. Natural magic as a, as a phenomenon in those centuries is one of the origins of the media culture as we know it these days. And it is also the kind of the origin of the so-called culture of attractions, including special effects movies in, in our times. I wonder if, if uh, Kircher actually managed to build this device because it's a little bit difficult to know. I believe that you would actually be able to distract the attention of the person for a little fraction of, of, of a second to be able to sort of like move the mirror in such a way that he would see his face being replaced by an animal or whatever. But this is also interesting. There would be much to say about this because this whole idea about metamorphosis happening between humans and animals is a, all another much, much longer history that can be excavated and, and, and to which this device is linked. There's another uh, famous example about projection and mirrors. Is this story about the famous uh, sorcerer or magician Nostradamus, who was obviously consulted by the French queen, Catherine de Medici, who was desperate you know, who would be the next king the, on the French throne after she's dead. Who will follow me on the, on the French throne? 
And so Nostradamus was consulted, and he obviously made his magic tricks and that. And then the queen looked into the mirror and saw a face, a man's face. In, the, in another version of the story, there's a whole parade of young guys, and these will be the next kings after you. And, and ever since that time, people have been trying to figure out how did Nostradamus fool the queen. And this is one explanation which basically seems to show that, that there was a war. Behind the wall, there was somebody sitting on the throne and uh, at the top, at B, there's, a, there's a, again a mirror at an angle. And that mirror reflects an image on another mirror, C, uh, which is why the queen would sort of like, I mean, how that would happen. There are other versions of the story as well. But I think that these stories are also an important part of the uh, kind of an archaeology of projection, whether this happened or not. Because the media culture is not just about real material objects. It's also always about the relationship between these objects to all kinds of discourses, the kind of ideas and fantasies and projects that never get realized, but they are whether they, but they are part of the culture anyway. Well, okay, magic lantern is a device that has played an enormously important role in the culture of projection. By the way, on the left, that is the magic lantern that I use for my magic lantern shows. I give them from time to time, in, mostly in California, because this, needs, this is heavy like crazy. It needs three men to lift this thing, you know? so I cannot sort of like travel nicely like a, like a sort of like traveling showman, so I, I mostly give shows a couple of times a year. I just recently gave a show at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And, um, and on, the, on the left, this is one of the earliest uh, existing devices. <laughs> so let's look at some of these magic lantern related, the, uh, the uh, manifestations of projection. Uh, there's the idea about magnifying images. And uh, what, 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 what's the kind of advantage? This is a famous painting from the 18th, from the 18th century. It's, it's now in the, at the British Museum. It's by an artist whose name was Paul Sandby, who was well known in the, the second half of the, of the uh, 18th century. It shows a typical situation where a touring showman with a boy uh, producing music have uh, uh, entered a home. It was typical in those years uh, not to have like permanent theaters for projecting images with so-called magic lanterns, so these slide projectors. Rather, the magic lantern show was kind of a mobile medium, so it was touring from place to place. So you see the showman and the boy in the middle. Yeah. The boy is producing music and he's projecting images over the, over the paintings. And you see that, that paintings here uh, are part of the salon, they are in frames, and on top of those frames you have actually attached that kind of a canvas and, and the images are much larger. We don't actually know exactly whether you would have been able to do project images at that size, but at least ideally in these kind of illustrations, it seems to kind of like imply the fact that the, it's sort of like it's, it's much much wider, uh, larger than those those permanent images, more or less permanent images you would have on those walls right here. Magnifying could also be linked with magnifying ideas like insects to large uh, scale, uh, uh, as you see happening in this illustration from the 18th century. The device you see on the top is the so-called solar microscope, which is like a magic lantern, but it uses natural light. So you would attach that kind of device, the, the top one, uh, into the out, uh, exterior wall or window of a building. And, and behind it, you have a mirror. And the mirror works like a so-called heliostat. 
heliostat is a device that uh, follows the course of the sun on the sky and tries to sort of like uh, gather its rays to, to, to kind of like uh, use it as a light source or something. And uh, so you would actually be able to use powerful light sources, powerful rays of light to, to for example, magnify tiny uh, slides of air where you would have like a, uh, an insect squeezed between two, two sheets of glass and making them look like these huge <laughs> monsters on the wall or something else like you see the big bottom. This is a picture from about 1750. Uh, the slide that's projected by the Magic Lantern projector on the bottom is the so-called uh, talkative monk with, uh, uh, device and I actually have the talkative monk in my collection. This is from 1720. It's one of the earliest preserved mechanical magic lantern slides. I didn't mention that I have a huge collection of these things. I, I hardly have space at my home. I'm, I'm thinking of moving elsewhere. You know, it takes all, my, all, the, all the space. You know, and, and, and my if my sisters come and visit me, they they are really kind of kind of kind of frustrated because there's no space to sleep. And, uh, and, uh, and my my little nephews cannot cannot run around freely at all because they're, they're bumped, they risk bumping at these, these optical antiques at every corner. You know. That's kind of life. You know. I should find a solution. Okay, so I'm amazing and frightening. So that's um, something I mentioned already. So monsters, ghosts, these kinds of devices. And what's interesting is that the first magic lantern slide that we know you know, there's little culture often preserved, preserved from these early times. We know a sketch by a famous scientist whose name is Christian Huygens. If you have heard that, if you study the history of science, you know the name of this guy. So he was from Holland. He invented many, many things. So he discovered the, the rings of Saturn that he looked, looked at with an early telescope. And he invented the pendulum clock and things like this. And, and from his manuscripts, we find this picture on the left, which is a sketch by him for a mechanical moving magic lantern slide from 1657. It shows um, the skeleton removing its skull and putting it back again like as an endless loop, like a, like a flash animation on the, on, the, on the internet screen. I actually reanimated this when I did a television series called Archaeology of the Moving Image many years ago. I reanimated at the television uh, animation studio, and it works perfectly. It's amazing. And um, so, so the magic lantern goes back, to, as far as we know, to the, like a mid-17th mid, uh, century. When you think about this amazement, uh, I think, and the frightening aspects, then the, then the key issue that you need to know is, is the so-called phantasmagoria that came some centuries later. And uh, uh, that happened during the French Revolution, uh, 1790s, and, and it, it was popular for several decades after that. So this idea of using magic lanterns frightened people, especially people who didn't know the secret, uh, was, was pretty much there from the beginning. The Jesuits used this already in China when they went, so like in their missionary, missionary um, um, so like uh, activities, and in other parts of the world. And so the idea there was that, that whether you are aware, if you're aware of the apparatus, or what if you're not, really affects the nature of the experience. But I mean that people became aware um, in those decades and centuries in between about the nature of the device. And what's interesting with this phantasmagoria, it, which I think is really the kind of, the, in a certain way, it's the origin of the whole horror movie, uh, sort of like kind of culture of media, use of media for special effects um, that have to do with the uncanny, all that, those things. 
is that, that there's no magic lantern visible anywhere. If you look at this, this picture of the presentation, it just have these skeletons and, and monsters appearing in the air. Um, in some illustrations, you peek, peek the lantern like here on the left, kind of like behind the screen, uh, but, uh, but you see that the skeleton is, is attacking you. Now, how did they do these things? And what was this thing all about? This is a famous uh, diagram from, from, the, from the memoirs of the person who basically was one of the inventors, not, probably not the real inventor of the phantasmagoria, but one of the first practitioners, whose name was Robert, who was active in Paris. Later, he traveled around from country to country, getting all the way to Moscow and uh, St. Petersburg with his show. And he was actually also an ironhound, so um, balloonist, the, with making balloon, balloon ascents in cities. And people would come around and see him fly across the skies. I love the fact that, you know, at the same time, he was this guy who was using his magic lanterns to evoke all these ghosts on the screens. And at the same time, so like riding the skies in his balloons, all these things. So what's happening in this picture, I think it's pretty interesting and, and has big implications when we think about the culture of projections at, at large. Is that on the left, at the point P, B, you see a large magic lantern. And that magic lantern is behind the screen. In the middle you see the screen. And, and that lantern is on rails. So it can be pulled back or pushed forward towards the screen. And because it has that possibility, so it basically makes it possible to make things approach or retreat from the screen. For example, you can, get, you can achieve an effect of a monster coming closer and closer and closer and closer until you screen. And, and like they claimed, you, you run away in fear. The other one on the other side, so which is the A, is a, is a hidden magic lantern that's been hidden inside a kind of a table. And that slant lantern on that side projects a background image, which in this case seems to be the corridor of a monastery, which you see projected on that screen in the, in the middle. So what you get when you combine these images is a composite image of two image sources. So you have the st st static background image and then you have the something that's happening within that, that image uh, created by that, that, by that moving mechanical uh, slide projector. Like the one on the left. This is a rare Received, preserved magic lantern from the beginning of the uh, 19th century. It's in a French collection in Versailles. So Francois Bigotry has it. Uh, on the right, you see my phantasmagoria from my collection. Uh, I don't have the platform, the the the, well, the wheels, but I have the original with with the original oil lamp and everything. That's a phantasmagoria for the phantasmagoria ghost projection. And this is the biggest one that's been preserved. It's taller than me. Imagine this monster machine. And this machine was really used exclusively to, to, to evoke ghosts. So they needed this kind of technology for that kind of ghost show. So, and again, it has uh, wheels. And it has a, a rather complex mechanism for keeping the image in focus. So the wheels the motion of the wheels have been uh, connected with the focusing mechanism of the magic lantern. So when you keep on pulling or pushing it, so it always keeps the image sharp. That's the, that's the basic idea. And the images have to be on a black background. This is pretty much the blue screen effect, the kind of similar effect. Because when the images are on a black background and you re-project these images, you actually uh, and if the hall is dark, you don't necessarily uh, uh, understand that, that it, it is actually a project with image. It looks like it's something hovering in the air.
luminous monster or Medusa's head or something like that. <coughs> this is a technology that was basically based on the phantasmagoric idea, which I think is really important to think about because it was so, so hugely popular and this is still used by many media artists in our times who, who use digital projection or whatever. And I don't know if this is very familiar for you, but if it isn't, so I think it is it's important to sort of like understand what it is. This is the so-called Pepper's Ghost Illusion that was uh, introduced a little bit later than the Phantasmagoria, basically a half a century later. And um, what's interesting here is that I think that when we talk about the kind of an archaeology of um, projection, so, so in most examples that I have shown you, we talk about cases where the projection is kind of like, uh, has to do with moving an image source to another place. So there's, a, there's an image or something that you are actually projecting. That was the same in some of those mirror projects and by the Jesuits, for example. But in, in those cases, you would actually draw the image or letters or something on the, on the sort of like parabolic mirror itself. And uh, so they didn't have the kind of the glass slide that the Magic Lantern uses, so transpa glass transparency that's project. But what happened with the Pepper's Ghost idea? Again, uh, it, it was uh, like Phantasmagoria using uh, hidden, so hidden media technology, but they used the Magic Lantern without uh, the slide. So instead of projecting a picture, you would actually just project a beam of light just like you would be using some kind of a, like a light spot in a, in, a, in a later sense. And you could use it to illuminate an actor, so human. And so, and this human's uh, likeness would be reflected from that sheet of glass, which you see between the auditorium and the stage. So the effect would be like what you see on the right, that the guy is actually finding a ghost. So it's a, it's a translucent, trans, so transparent apparition which you see on the on the stage, and and I think that this is interesting because I mean that it sort of like looks at the idea about the light beam and the, and the magic lantern in a different different way. So like looking at the certain kind of properties of the, that light beam itself and links it with something else. Then we get to finally get things like Alan McCall's work where, where you don't actually necessarily need even this human, you just need the kind of the certain kind of nature of the light beam itself. I think this whole whole history about how the light beam interacts with light beams projecting image imagery is a is a really interesting and important important one. And when we get to the get to talk about a little bit of this these architectural things that, that becomes a kind of a important issue. Um, I, I'm very interested in this functioning of the apparatus in most cases and uh, in the 1820s, so shall we say like, um, like uh, 25 years after the Phantasmagoria made its breakthrough in, in this kind of form, rather so like technologically heavy forms, it's interesting that in England uh, a new idea was presented, and the idea was that it's sort of like a phantasmagoria made easy. And, and this is uh, the so-called handheld phantasmagoria, where the idea is that you have a much smaller magic lantern, and instead of having the magic lantern on wheels, you actually use your belt. <laughs> You attach it to your belt, and, and here you are, you are a mobile magic lantern man, moving behind the screen. And um, this is the picture that the inventor used about the, uh, to introduce his idea in 1823. Look, look closely at the image that he's projecting. He basically, was basically saying that actually you can make these animals walk very, very kind of nicely when you sort of like move your body with the magic lantern and, and with the other end and you will have to keep it sharp 
And it's kind of poor man's phantasmagoria, so to say. So look closely at the image compared with this one on the left. Same, I think. And look at this showman. <laughs> <laughs> you know what happened? I found the only known example of that magic lantern in Paris in 2006. And in the box, it came with slides and it had exactly the same slide. No one has ever no, seen another example of this magic lantern. We didn't even know if it was really sold. And then I was in Paris and I went to this little shop and I saw this dusty lantern in the corner and I said, oh, you have that lantern, it's probably not interesting. Oh, c'est trop cher, je ne peux pas, je n'en acheter. C'est impossible, monsieur, je ne peux pas payer 400 euros. <laughs> and, and I was just kind of like, like trembling. <laughs> so like, I said, okay, I'll make it cheaper, you know. Okay. I would have paid much more than that. Poor <laughs> guy. <laughs> because it's the only one. This is a, I'm demonstrating it in a, in a, in a, in a little castle. In near, outside Paris, near Fontainebleau, uh, that summer. So this is part of, by the way, the media archaeological practice. <laughs> Here, the lantern is just pointing out the belt loops at the backside of the magic lantern to demonstrate that it's correct. This is where you attach the belt, like this one. Mixing realities. Also making, replacing physical things. It's really interesting to me that from the earliest times when people started talking about magic lanterns, which is the second half of the uh, 17th century, you get ideas that you, you don't actually believe that, you know, that these people could have had. So, I mean, we tend to think that people are pretty primitive, you know, like a couple of hundreds of years ago. Let's say if they have this magic lantern, you know, like a little box with a light source, a candle, or oil lamp inside, and, and, and a couple of hand painted slides, and, and a couple of lenses, and then you project these little images. We think, okay, that was enough you know, that people were, you know, that they were not so smart. This is often a complete misunderstanding. People are very smart in their, their times, you know, in, in history. They often understand very, very sharply the possibilities of, of the, the kind of devices that, that are invented and end up in their hands. And of course, they are always looking for new uses. They're not kind of pleased with just kind of showing little kind of pictures of like, like, uh, like monsters on the wall. And with the magic lantern, for example, very soon we find the, all these interesting uses proposed. For example, idea of the projection clock it appears almost as soon as the magic lantern itself. So which means basically you would be putting a clock inside the lantern and then you would project the time. You have a, like a transparent clock face and you put it on the... On, I, people are buying these from shops these days. So you can project the time on, on the ceiling of your bedroom or something like that. Many people think it's a late 20th century invention. And, and they, don't, they, they don't believe it. I said, oh, that's the first invention. That's one of the first inventions, uses of the magic lantern. And another interesting idea was the, was the sort of like the real-time weather indicator that could be the magic lantern. And that means that you would have the weather weight or weather cock, whatever, on the roof. So you would have actually a metal pole coming down from the roof through the, through the ceiling. And that metal pole would be attached to a magic lantern with got like a couple of wheels and things like that. So whenever the, the wind changes the position of the weathercock on the, on, the, on, the, on the roof, the indicator will tell you exactly the direction of the wind in, inside, inside the house. I think it's pretty, pretty interesting. It's a real-time real indicator diagram. That, that sort of like was imagined 
very, very soon after this technology became available. 